Good morning, Anderson. Thank you so much for tuning in and worshiping with us this morning. Um, in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, it's Jesus is um, giving the Sermon on the Mount. And in this sermon, um, he is telling the people, um, as Christians, you know, we don't light a candle and put a bowl over it. So in the same way, we should not hide um, our faith. We should not cover our light up. We are the light of the world, and we should show that light to other people. Um, and so some of you may have heard the saying, um, you know, people say they, they should know we are Christians by our love. And I think this is a great thing to think about. You know, we want to be, we want to look different from other people as we walk down the street. We want people to say, there's something different about that person um, by the way that we love, by the way that we act. Um, so let's sing this. This is Let Him See Love. There is a darkness that drowns out the light When we hold a candle out of sight And there is a storm that can kill all that's right When we run for cover in the night When light shines in darkness, the darkness will fade We all have a candle to raise Let him see love. Let him see love. Let him see love. Let him see the love. Imagine the difference of darkness for gone. We held a can. Or for those who belong And what if surrender was our greatest song Darkness would run as light became strong Life is a story and we play a role God's great design for the soul Father, thank you so much um, for giving us the opportunity to worship and um, to live our lives in a way that shows that you are with us. Um, and I just pray that we will go out and we will remember that people, can, people will know that we are different by the way that we love. And I pray that you will give us um, opportunities to love people um, in the way that you have loved us. And in your precious name we pray. Amen.
Hello, Anderson University. It's my privilege to spend this chapel time with you in God's Word. So if you have your Bibles around, go ahead and turn to Psalm 136. Psalm 136 is our text for today. Our topic for today is the God who deserves our thanks. And speaking of thanks, in just a few weeks, this COVID semester will be finally over and we'll get to go home and celebrate what, is prob- what will probably be the strangest Thanksgiving any of us has ever celebrated before. But it'll still be Thanksgiving, and we'll still have some of that blessed time off right before exams, so that's definitely something to be thankful for. You know, Thanksgiving itself has actually been celebrated as a national holiday on and off since 1789. It began with the proclamation of George Washington, but it didn't actually become an official holiday until 1863. Ironically, at the time, America was in the brink, on the brink of dissolution during the Civil War. And at that time, several months after the bloody Battle of Gettysburg, Lincoln proclaimed Thanksgiving to be a, quote, national holiday of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father who dwelleth in the heavens. The date of it has since changed, but from its inception as a holiday, Thanksgiving has provided a ready occasion for Americans to express gratitude for all kinds of things. In fact, if you add a, ask an American today, uh, these days, what they're most thankful for, you're probably going to get some unusual answers. Recently, I had the opportunity to ask my students in one of my classes, what was the most unusual thing that they were thankful for on this Thanksgiving? Their answers were pretty entertaining. Some said being single. One person said the egg crate on his bed. Others said taste buds or our pet beta fish in our dorm. Having time to to read for fun. These are, after all, Christian studies students. They don't have time to read for fun a lot. Custom tennis rackets, air conditioning, having a tongue to speak with, going shopping, ginger ale, hands. There were quite a few students who listed coffee as one of the things they were thankful for. Several people uh, put uh, things like sunshine or learning how to bench press correctly. One student was thankful for their anxiety. Another was thankful for eyebrows. She said, we look so weird without them. Having balance, orange juice, thumbs, weakness and struggles in my life, my watch, and lastly, my favorite, fried okra. Can I get an amen on that? Now, most of these are great things, especially fried okra, and I'm a big fan of thumbs and taste buds as well. But then I also ask my students a more serious question, what they were most thankful for. And here are some of those answers. Being a student at AU, family, friends that constantly point me to Christ, God's sovereignty, parents who love the Lord, my boyfriend. One guy said his mommy. I thought that was sweet. Prayer. Christ's sacrifice for our sins and God's grace. These are all great things to be thankful for. In fact, the biblical writers echo a lot of those same things. So what would you say you are most thankful for? Well, the psalmist in our text today has one thing, one thing that he is thankful for, one thing above all else. In fact, this is perhaps the most famous Thanksgiving psalm that we have in the entire Bible. In fact, this, in our day and age, this where most of our Thanksgiving accolades go to things like family and friends and finances and facilities and football and even fried okra. In our day and age, it might be considered unusual for someone to be thankful for this one thing. Now, I'm not going to tell you what this one thing is, but I think as I read this psalm, you'll notice pretty quickly what it is. So let's read the psalm together, Psalm 136, starting in verse 1. This is a long psalm, but just bear with me. Give thanks to the, to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who alone does great wonders, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who made the heavens with skill, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who spread out the, he- the earth above the waters, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who made the great lights, for his loving kindness is everlasting. The sun to rule by day, for his loving kindness is everlasting. The moon and stars to rule by night, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who smote the Egyptians in their firstborn, for his loving kindness is everlasting. And brought Israel out from their midst, for his loving kindness is everlasting. With a strong hand and an outstretched arm, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who divided the Red Sea asunder, for his loving kindness is everlasting. And made Israel to pass through the midst of it, for his loving kindness is everlasting. He overthrew Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea, for his loving kindness is everlasting. 
to him who led his people through the wilderness, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who smote great kings, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Who slew mighty kings, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Sihon, king of the Amorites, for his loving kindness is everlasting. And Og, king of Bashan, for his loving kindness is everlasting. And gave their land as a heritage, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Even a heritage to Israel, his servant, for his loving kindness is everlasting who remembered us in our low estate, for his loving kindness is everlasting, and has rescued us from our adversaries, for his loving kindness is everlasting, who gives food to all flesh, for his loving kindness is everlasting, and give thanks to the God of heaven, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Let's pray as we begin. Father, we pray that as we read this psalm and study it, Father, we pray that we would have our wills conform to yours, and your will is that we should be thankful Thankful not just for what you've done, but for who you are. Guide us in our thoughts, uh, guide us in our hearts, through your spirit and through your word. Speak to us this day, in Christ's name, amen. So Psalm 136 is known for a number of things. It's, a, it's the last of the Hallel Psalms, that are Psalms 113 through Psalm, Psalm 118. These are all songs that are sung during the, the great Jewish pilgrimage festivals, three of those. In fact, the Jewish Talmud refers to this psalm as the great Hallel. It's traditionally sung at the end of the Jewish Passover. It probably was also prayed at the Last Supper, celebrated by Jesus and his, and his disciples in the upper room on the night that he was betrayed. In fact, in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, both state, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. That hymn was probably Psalm 136. One of the most beautiful things about this psalm is how unambiguous it is, how clear it is in its message. The psalm is, is all about giving thanks to God. He's all about giving multiple reasons for giving thanks to God. He's all about exhorting us, you and me, God's people, to join him in giving thanks for these multiple reasons. In fact, you'll find in verses 1 through 3, the phrase and the exhortation, give thanks. And you don't find that again until verse 26, where it again says give thanks. But the implication is that everything in between should be introduced with an exhortation to give thanks. So you could really read this verse by verse going for each of the 26 verses. Give thanks, give thanks, give thanks. But the psalmist also points to one overarching reason for giving thanks, one thing that summarizes all those other reasons. Did you notice what it was? The first thing most people notice about this psalm is its repetition of the phrase, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Every verse, 26 times. If you read the Old Testament, you'll see this phrase repeated multiple times, not just in the Psalms, but also in books like Chronicles. In fact, we have it written on our chalkboard in our kitchen at home. One reason for the repetition in the psalm is that it's an antiphonal psalm, where the song is sung by two alternating groups. The worship leader would sing the first part, the congregation would sing the repeated phrase. So I know this is a virtual chapel, chapel but why don't we try this at home? Your, your roommate won't think you're weird, I promise. So I'm going to read the first three verses. I will say something, and you respond even in your dorm room. Try that out. So in Psalm 136, verse 1, it says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And you would say, For his loving kindness is everlasting. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Now you're all prepared to go to synagogue on the Sabbath. So as you can see, the way Psalm 136 is sung has a way of emphasizing and driving home the main point. Well, what's the main point? Whatever God has done, whether his creation, whether his redemption in the Exodus, whether his provision, whoever God is, his greatness, his sovereignty, his grace, his glory, all these things can be summarized in the phrase, his loving kindness is everlasting. Another way of looking at this is whatever we're thankful for. The psalmist says that the most important thing to give thanks to God for is his everlasting loving kindness. Now, if you've had a crib class before, you probably have heard me use this Hebrew word, chesed, before, commonly translated in our Bibles as steadfast love or faithful love or loving kindness. And it's, I, I've used it a lot because, frankly, in the Old Testament, it is used a lot. It summarizes the totality of God's character. Indeed, if, if you're talking about God in the Old Testament, it's the most common word used to describe his character and actions. Now, no English word can really render the meaning of it, which is why the New American Standard Version of the Bible that I'm reading from uses a word, loving kindness, that they basically invent. 
So they take love and kindness and stick it together to try to get at the meaning, but it really doesn't cover it. It occurs an amazing 246 times in the Old Testament, with half of those being in the Psalms. In almost three-quarters of those Old Testament occurrences, this is what it refers to. Not love and kindness, but so much more. It describes the gracious disposition and actions of God towards His covenant people. It's the type of covenantal grace and love that is lively and loyal, committed and compassionate, gracious and good, undeserving and unchanging, true and trustworthy, pure and protective. It's the kind of disposition you might have towards your family members or your best friends or maybe one day to your spouse. Only contrary to our covenant love that we have for each other, God's chesed towards the believer and to the body of believers is unpolluted, undefiled, perfected. Indeed, if God is love in the New Testament, God is chesed in the Old. So imagine that all of God's character and actions towards His people summarized by one word. There are three great qualities of God's chesed. The first is that God's great chesed is directed towards His people, to His church. If you're listening to this this morning and you're a believer in Jesus Christ, adopted into His family and grafted into His body, if that is you, You are a recipient of God's lively and loyal, committed and compassionate, gracious and good, undeserving and unchanging, true and trustworthy, pure and protective chesed. And if you're not a believer this morning, that chesed is available to you through Christ. Think about that. It makes, you, it makes you marvel. It makes you want to cry out as the great Charles Wesley did in his hymn, Amazing Love, How Can It Be? One of the most beloved psalms that many of you can quote is Psalm 23. Of course, it begins famously, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Well, what does the last verse say? The last verse says that surely goodness and mercy will pursue me all the days of my life. That word for mercy is, guess what? Chesed. Now, when I, when I was a kid, I always wondered what surely goodness and surely mercy were in And I wasn't sure I wanted them to follow me all the days of my life, but now that I'm a little bit older, I want them to follow me. The word to follow here or pursue normally describes the actions of a pillaging army or even covenant curses in the Old Testament. But the psalmist here is convinced that instead of the covenant curse that he deserves, the Lord's chesed will hunt him down relentlessly instead. How does God ultimately do this? Of course, the realization The fulfillment of God's relentless chesed is seen in Jesus himself. John 1.14 famously states, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of, it's translated in our Bibles as grace, full of chesed and truth, emeth in the Old Testament. Do you want to know what God's chesed is for you, with you, pursuing you, You look to Jesus. Look to his love for you that drove him to the cross. The second great thing about God's chesed is that it is also everlasting. It's directed towards us, yes, but it's also everlasting. It doesn't change. You know, when it comes to Thanksgiving, Americans love Thanksgiving traditions. NFL football, usually the Cowboys and the Lions playing pretty much since the mid part of the last century, gathering with family and friends, the presidential pardon of the turkey that's occurred since 1947. And of course, you have the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade since 1924. But even some of those long-standing traditions are not immune from change. This year, even uh, the Macy's Parade is changing. You may have heard that due to COVID and the safety measures that they're trying to enforce, it's not going to follow its usual route. In fact, it's going to be a pre-recorded television-only presentation. No crowds, No screaming kids. But here's one thing that does not change if you are God's covenant people, if you are in Christ today. It doesn't change from Thanksgiving to Thanksgiving, from decade to decade, even from century to century. From beginning to end, what does not change is God's great chesed. For this reason, the focus of our thanksgiving can be the same today as it was 10 years ago, as it was at the Last Supper, as it was 
at the first Passover. God's great chesed, it never changes. Haddon Robinson tells the story of a young man who lived in Chicago who went down to the bluegrass regions of Kentucky to uh, meet his wife, and he wooed this young woman there and ultimately brought her back to Chicago as his bride. I can relate to this story because I met my wife in Kentucky. They enjoyed three lovely years of marriage, and then one day in the midst of a sickness, in a seizure of pain, the young woman lost her mind. Robinson said that at her best, she was a bit demented. At her worst, she would scream, and the neighbors would complain because her screams would cut the air. And so the young businessman left his home in the middle of Chicago and went out to the western suburbs, hoping that that would help. He built a house there, determined that here he would try to nurse his wife back to health and sanity again. One day, the family physician suggested that perhaps if he took his wife back to her home in Kentucky, that something about those familiar surroundings might help to restore her sanity. And so they went back to the old homestead. Hand in hand, they walked through the old house where memories hung on every corner. They went down to the garden and walked by the riverside. But after several days, nothing seemed to happen. So defeated and discouraged, the young man put his wife back in the car and they headed back to Chicago. When they got close to the house, he looked over and discovered that his wife was asleep. It was the first deep, restful sleep that she had had in many weeks. When he got to the house, he lifted her from the car and took her inside, placed her head on the bed and realized that she was still needing to sleep some more. So he placed a cover over her and just sat beside her bed and watched her through the midnight hour, watched her until the first rays of sun reached through the curtain and brushed her face. The young woman finally awoke. She saw her husband seated by her side. She says, I, I, I seem to have been on a long journey. Where have you been? And that man, speaking out of days and weeks and months of patient waiting and watching, said, my sweetheart, I've been right here waiting for you all the time. God's chesed is very much the same and never leaves you, never forsakes you, even pursues you, for his loving kindness is everlasting. But the third great thing about God's great chesed is that because his chesed is, is directed towards us and is everlasting, is invaluable. I love to read the Puritans. They had a certain way of expressing things, usually with some very long prose. In other words, they were not short on words, like some of the student papers I read sometimes. Thomas Brooks, a Puritan writer, tried to express the value of God's chesed in one of his writings. He said this, Divine favor, chesed, is better than life. It's better than life with all its, with all its revenues, with all its honors and riches and pleasures and applause. Yes, it's better than many lives put together. Now you know uh, what a high rate men value their lives. They will bleed, sweat, vomit, purge, part with an estate, yes, limbs to preserve their lives. As he cried out, give me any deformity, any torment, any misery so that you spare my life. Now though life be so dear and precious to a man, yet a deserted soul prizes the returnings of divine favor, of divine chesed upon him above life, yes, above many lives. Many have been weary of their lives, as is evident in Scripture and history. But Brooks says, but no one was ever yet found that was weary of the love and favor of God. No one sets so high a price upon the sun as one who has lain long in a dark dungeon. Let me say that again. Such a beautiful way of expressing it. No one sets so high a price upon the sun as one who has lain long in a dark dungeon. So that's the main reason for Thanksgiving this Thanksgiving season. If you're struggling to find things to be thankful to God for, the psalm gives you the answer. God's invaluable, never-ending chesed directed at you as part of God's covenant people. But the psalmist doesn't stop there. In every verse, he goes on to provide us with multiple examples of God's chesed. In so doing, he provides us with multiple reasons to give thanks to God. Now, you can basically group those reasons into two categories. Thank God for who he is, and thank God for what he has done. First, God deserves thanks for who he is. In the first three verses, the psalmist characterizes God in two main ways. First, that God is good, and second, that God is great. Now, in Hebrew, when you encounter the phrase, 
X of X or something of something, it's to demonstrate superlative, the best of the best. For instance, our book Song of Songs in our Bibles means the song of all songs, the greatest of songs. If I was a Hebrew, I might say that Elizabeth, my wife, is the wife of all wives, the greatest of all wives. Or in a few weeks, you might describe your exams that you take as the exams of all exams, the hardest of all exams. Or you might describe AU as the college of all colleges, the best of all colleges. For the psalmist to say that God is the Lord of lords, the God of gods, he means that God is the greatest of all sovereigns, the greatest of all kings. No false god can compare to him. Now, this type of thankfulness is contrary to what most do at Thanksgiving. Mostly during Thanksgiving, we thank God for stuff and for circumstances. But to quote pastor and writer Michael Youssef, true biblical Thanksgiving does not focus on our circumstances, but on the character of God. And here's the reason. He writes, circumstances change. God does not. Now, undoubtedly, the Bible does not discourage our thankfulness for material and earthly things like fried ochre or thumbs or eyebrows for that matter, or even spouses or colleges. Indeed, as we'll discuss in a minute, the psalm, this psalm itself even illustrates that principle. It praises God for deliverance and for provision and even for creation itself. Yet though quick to praise God for no lack of good things, if we're quoting from Psalm 34.3, the psalmist rarely stopped there throughout the book of Psalms. In fact, his praise and thanksgiving for earthly things always results in a praise to Magnify the Lord with me and exalt his name together, Psalm 34, 3. So let me ask you this. If we just thank God for the good things and the good times, what happens when things and times are not so peachy? Can we be thankful and have thankful hearts when the previous year saw a pandemic, the loss of a job, the death of a friend or family member, a serious sickness, brokenness, depression, deep sorrow. This question is much more pressing as many people, many more people in our world, in our fallen world today, and especially in our current COVID-19 world, many more people are suffering than are not. So can we thank God when all around us is burning? The psalmist answers the question, yes. Job, the standard bearer of suffering in the Bible, states, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord, Job 1.21. So in loss of everything or in gain, Job blesses God. How can Job have this attitude? Because he trusts in God's unchanging character and changing circumstances. God's chesed is everlasting. Paul in prison exhorts his fellow Christians to rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice to fill their prayers with thanksgiving in Philippians 4. Even as he himself has few earthly things for which to be thankful except things like imprisonment or torture or beatings or persecution. The reason he can have such an attitude is he, is he counted all the material things of his life, the temporal things as dung, to use a technical term, as poo, for the sake of the unchanging Christ, Philippians 3, 7 and 8. Thus, though he might encounter the sword or suffering or even death itself, Paul thanked God and he possessed all that he possessed all that he needed, and desired. He was content in Christ. This Thanksgiving season, may our hearts be directed to thank God for provision and protection, for jobs and joy, for turkeys and toys, but most of all, let us praise Him for who He is, the unchanging God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 1.3. But of course, we should also thank God, not just for who he is. As this psalm demonstrates, we should thank God for what he has done. And the psalmist mentions two main things, his creation and his redemption. First, creation. In a short history of nearly everything, a man named Bill Bryson marvels at what makes up a human life. He writes, no one really knows, but there may be as, a million, as many as a million types of protein in the human body. Each one is a little miracle. By all laws of probability, proteins shouldn't exist, he says. To make a protein, you need to assemble amino acids. By the way, I'm not a scientist, but I'm hoping he is. In particular order, and you need to assemble them in a particular order in much the same way you assemble letters in a particular order to spell out a word. 
For example, to make collagen, you need to arrange 1,055 amino acids in precisely the right sequence. The chances of a 1,055 sequence molecule like collagen spontaneously self-assembling are frankly nil. It's just not going to happen. To grasp what a long shot its existence is, he writes, visualize a standard Las Vegas slot machine, but broaden greatly to about 90 feet. To be precise, to accommodate the 1,055 spinning wheels instead of the usual three or four, with 20 symbols on each wheel, one for each common amino acid. How long would you have to pull the handle before all 1,055 symbols came up in the right order? Effectively forever, he writes, even if you reduce the number of spinning wheels to 200, which is actually more of a typical number of amino acids, the odds against all 200 coming up with the prescribed sequence are 1 in 10 to the 260th power. Yet we are talking about several hundred thousand types of proteins, perhaps even a million, each unique, each, as far as we know, vital to the maintenance of a sound and happy you. So there you go. The next time you're thankful for your thumb or your eyebrows as something that you're thankful for, you have a different way of looking at them. So let's thank God for his great creation, our very life, but also for his redemption, our new life. The focus of the psalmist's next list of things to be thankful for is God's redemption, specifically, in this context, the Exodus. And there's a reason. The Exodus was considered by the Jewish, uh, the Jewish readers the great salvation event in the Old Testament. God told the people of Israel that it was there that he redeemed them. It was there that they became his people. It was there that they saw the salvation of, the God, of God. So when Israel thought of the Exodus, they thought of salvation. Well, we too have a great salvation event, but it's not the Exodus from Egypt. For those of us living in the New Testament era, our salvation event is what D Jesus did for us on the cross. And instead of a lamb sacrificed at the Passover before the Exodus, we have what 1 Peter 1.19 calls the, quote, precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Our salvation event is Jesus' death on the cross for us that washed away our sins, that gave us a relationship with God and a home with him in heaven. That, friends, is something to be thankful for. So this Thanksgiving season, what are you thankful for? Turkey and toss footballs or something deeper? God's great chesed for who he is, for what he has done, all of which is summarized in what God did for us and through us and in us in the person of Jesus Christ. You may have heard the story of a Vietnam veteran and Air Force colonel named John Mansour. He tells of an eight-year-old orphan girl who was wounded after a misdirected mortar attack in the Vietnam War. An American Navy doctor and nurse were called to try to minister to this girl, but they surmised that the little girl would die unless a blood transfusion did not take place. A quick test showed that neither, the Amer neither of the Americans had the correct type of blood, but several of the uninjured orphans did. The doctor spoke very little Vietnamese, and the nurse spoke a smattering of, of high school French, and using that combination along with some very much impromptu sign language, they tried to explain to their young, frightened audience that unless they could replace the, some of the little girl's blood, she would certainly die. Then they asked if anyone would be willing to give blood to help. Their request was met with wide-eyed silence. After several long moments, a small hand slowly, waveringly, went up, dropped back down, and then went up again. Oh, thank you, the nurse said in French. What's your name? Hing, came the reply. Hing was quickly laid on a pallet and his arms swabbed with alcohol, the needle inserted into his vein. And through this ordeal, Hing lay stiff and silent. After a moment, he let out a shuddering sob, quickly covering his face with his free hand. His occasional sobs gave way to steady and silent crying. His eyes screwed tightly shut, his fist in his mouth to stifle the sobs. The medical team were, they were concerned. Something was obviously very wrong. At this point, a Vietnamese nurse arrived to help. Seeing the little one's distress, she spoke to him rapidly in Vietnamese and listening to his reply and answering him in a soothing voice. After a moment, the patient stopped crying, 
looked questioningly at the Vietnamese nurse, and when she nodded, a look of great relief spread over his face. Glancing up, the nurse said quietly to the Americans, he thought he was dying. He misunderstood you. He thought he had, that you would ask him to give all his blood so this little girl could live. But why would he be willing to do that? Asked the Navy nurse. The Vietnamese nurse repeated the question to the little boy, who simply answered, because she's my friend. It's a glimpse of the kind of incredible, incomprehensible chesed Christ has for you. No one has greater love than this, than someone would lay down his life for his friends. What Jesus said in John 15, 13. And if you want a visible demonstration and definition of chesed, here it is. Jesus on the cross. If you want to be, have something to be thankful for this Thanksgiving season, look at what Jesus did for us. But God proves his own love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for you. Romans 5, 8. If you're a Christian, there's nothing greater than this that you have to give thanks for the Thanksgiving season. Your sins are forgiven. You have new life in Christ. And if you're not a believer, listening to this, that chesed is for you as well. Christ died for you. Let's say it together again. For his loving kindness is everlasting. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together in your word. We thank you for the reminder that it gives us that God's chesed is great, it's immeasurable, incomprehensible, beautiful, good, gracious, glorious. It is everlasting. Father, I pray if there are those listening to this who perhaps for the first time are realizing God's great love for them. The love that sent Jesus to the cross. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I pray that today they might be that whosoever who believes. And they will not perish, but have everlasting life. Father, for those of us who are believers in Christ, may we once again be struck by the wonder, the majesty, and the glory of the cross and the grace and the love of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. May God bless you this Thanksgiving season.